Welcome to Organic Chemistry 2 Radicals and Polymerization. In this very first lecture, we'll be looking at a general introduction into radical chemistry and uh, we will elaborate on what a radical, an organic radical in particular, actually is. Let's jump straight in. Organic chemistry by Clayton, Greaves, Warren and Wovers finds a great way how to compare radicals in ions. Um, it says, think of radicals as smash and grab raiders. They pick the first shot that catches their eye, smash the window and run off with a handful of jewelry from the front of a display. Ions in solution, on the other hand, are stealthy burglars. They scan all the houses on the street, choose the most vulnerable and then carefully gain entry to the room that uh, they know contains a priceless oil painting. So. Uh, Away from the imagery of burglars and raiders, uh, you can think of radicals as highly reactive species. Yeah? And uh, we will look at their formation and their reaction in the following. Biologically very important radical you have already come across. Yeah? This would be molecular oxygen or O2. Um, you have come across the diuretical character of molecular oxygen and the discussion of molecular orbital theory. So, as we remember, um, oxygen itself, uh, yeah, so uh, a single atom oxygen brings two electrons uh, in the 2s atomic orbital. So, we're just going to mark them down here, yeah, so two electrons. And 2s atomic orbital each, and then we have four additional electrons in the 2p atomic orbital. So it means uh, when we combine two oxygen atoms to a molecular uh, um, oxygen O2. Uh, we start now to distribute our electrons. So two electrons uh, end up here in our sigma bonding uh, molecular orbital. Then uh, the other two electrons from the two S atomic orbitals uh, go into the sigma star. And now we are left with a total of eight electrons to distribute. So two again into our sigma, four into our pi molecular orbitals. And now we're left with two electrons, which we distribute across two uh, energetically de degenerate pi star molecular orbitals. Yeah? So we end up with two unpaired electrons in the, um, in the highest occupied molecular orbitals here. Yeah? So the uh, um, more correct way uh, to represent a molecular oxygen um, is, uh, is depicted here at the bottom yeah? and not here at the top. Yeah? So uh, that means uh, we have one unpaired electron in each of the oxygen atoms in our molecular oxygen O2. Now, uh, such a diradical um, as oxygen uh, um, is involved in DNA damage and other cellular degradation processes. However, it also enables powerful chemical transformations, as we see here at the bottom. So here we see guanine, yeah, one of our four main nucleobases found uh, in, in the nucleic acids of DNA and RNA. Yeah. So uh, you see here on the left hand side our pyridine ring pyridine ring of our guanine and here is our imidazole ring Uh, these two fused rings form our guanine um, and uh, now guanine can react with molecular oxygen in water and what we essentially get is a substitution 
of this uh, imidazole hydrogen for a hydroxy group here in 8 position yeah, to give our 8 hydroxy guanine. Moses Gomberg is credited with the uh, discovery of organic free radicals during his tenure at the University of Michigan. Um, in fact, he was the first to speculate uh, um, about trivalent carbon. Now, this was a revolutionary idea because um, even at the end of the 19th century, uh, everyone understood that carbon would be tetravalent. Um, so, uh, uh, and, but, but one of his experiments um, uh, led him to believe uh, that there could be a free radical containing carbon, yeah, an organic free radical. Um, so uh, Moses Gomberg was trying to synthesize um, a carbon compound called a hexaphenyl ethane, which you see here, yeah? a highly sterically demanding molecule with six of his phenyl uh, groups attached to one central ethane backbone. Um, so um, he recognized that he uh, uh, had found during his synthesis um, a long elusive free radical yeah, and showed that carbon is not always tetravalent. Yeah? And uh, uh, like I said, this was uh, a, revol a revolutionary find because uh, um, tetravalent carbon was presumed to be the, uh, the only state for carbon. Um, so uh, Gomberg was trying to make this hexaphenyl ethane um, uh, via Wurz coupling yeah, of triphenyl methyl chloride. So Wurz coupling works either with zinc yeah, or with silver. Um, and uh, in the first step you generate your zinc chloride or your silver chloride if you're using silver. Um, and you, you get a somewhat stable uh, um, radical, a carbon radical. Um, so it's somewhat stable in solution. Yeah? And this, uh, this uh, um, radical species here exists in equilibrium with its quinoid dimer, which you see here on the bottom left hand side. So you can imagine that um, this radical here can be delocalized across the molecule. Yeah? We represent the movement of radicals with this, these fish hook arrows, but we'll, we'll come to this in a bit. Yeah, so you can delocalize this single radical across the, uh, this molecule into this position. And now, of course, you could imagine that such a species, yeah, such a quinoid species, this would be the result of such a delocalization. Could then go on and react with a, with another um, carbon-centered radical. To give you your quinoid dimer, which I'm depicting here at the bottom. Yeah. So this is our quinoid dimer. Um, he also saw that. Um, uh, uh, by evaporating the solution um, and under oxygen atmosphere, um, you would get this this kind of white solid. Yeah. So um, a product of a reaction with uh, our molecular oxygen diradical, um, and from the discrepancies in elemental analysis. Um, he would find that, oh, uh, this is not our hexaphenyl ethane, which I set out to synthesize, but it must be something else. 
Yeah, but the sheer fact that he was able to um, uh, to uh, uh, isolate the, uh, the quinoid dimer and uh, the somewhat stable um, radical species in solution led him led him to believe that indeed uh, trivalent carbon can exist, um, and he realized. Uh, in his paper, yeah, which was quite customary back in the day, he laid claim to this field by stating this work will be continued and I wish to reserve the field for myself. Yeah? He very qu quickly realized, however, that uh, radical chemistry um, is a far too big field uh, uh, for himself um, and laid the foundation for modern radical chemistry. There are several ways how to form radicals and we will go through each of these five examples given here very briefly um, in more detail on the following slides. Um, so for example, we can form radicals via the homolysis of weak sigma bonds. Yeah, so here we have a, um, a bond between two neighboring oxygen atoms uh, which we can cleave by their heat or their light into two radicals. So let's just draw uh, draw in our fish hook arrows. Yeah. So we are cleaving the sigma bond between oxygen and oxygen, and are localizing our radicals uh, one electron um, on each of these oxygen atoms. Then uh, we can uh, generate radicals by electron transfer or reduction. Yeah. Here. We are essentially picking up an electron and cleaving this double bond to generate from our ketone a ketyl radical. We can um, generate radicals via abstraction, yeah, some, or, or called substitution, yeah, or more uh, more concrete second-order homolytic substitution, or SH2 for short. Yeah, so here we are essentially forming a new bond between X and Y and cleaving the bond between Y and Z yeah, to get our new XY compound and a Z radical. Yeah? So we've effect effectively um, substituted Z for X. Or <clears throat> we can add a radical to a double bond, for example, between Y and Z. Yeah. And the other electron from that YZ double bond goes then on to our Z, yeah. Right here. So we've, we've essentially added this radical X to our double bond and ge generated a new radical center. And in reverse of this process, we have elimination, yeah. also homolysis of a YZ bond. So in this case, the radical on X recombines with an electron from the YZ bond. Yeah, to form a new XY double bond and a free Z radical. So we've briefly um, introduced the concept of homolysis. Yeah? So homolysis is um, the process in which bonds break yeah? and the atoms get one bonding electron each. Yeah? So products of homolysis are radicals. Contrast that with um, heterolytic cleavage yeah, or heterolysis. Here, um, uh, when we break a bond, one atom gets both bonding electrons. Yeah? And the products of such heterolytic cleavage 
are ions. Yeah, so let's let's go through these examples in more detail. So here in this case, we have heterolytic cleavage of a carbon chlor uh, chlorine bond, yeah, and we represent this via um, curly arrows. Yeah, and we know curly arrows move two bonding electrons. So uh, they also indicate where the electrons come from. Yeah, in this case, they come from here our carbon plus here on the right hand side and where the electrons go. Yeah, they go here towards uh, an A minus. Yeah, in this case, so the leaving group and here in this case, it's our chloride, which we are forming. So as you can see, um, we have now formed uh, two ions. Yeah, this heterolytic cleavage and our chloride has eight electrons in the outer shell. Yeah, contrast that with homolysis. Yeah, so here in this case we have a chlorine-chlorine bond which we are breaking by a light. Yeah, in this case we're ending up um, with seven electrons in the outer outer shell of each of these uh, um, chlorine radicals. Yeah, let's draw in the fish hook arrows this time. So fish hook arrows, as we saw on the previous slides, they move one electron only. Yeah, so we end up here with our Cl dot. Yeah, and the Cl dot indicates that we have a single unpaired electron on uh, our chlorine. Yeah. Um, and now if you if you uh, do the electron and proton count, you realize, uh, okay, um, chlorine has seven protons. So with seven electrons in the outer shell, we, uh, we end up with, uh, with a neutral species. Yeah? So radicals are neutral species. Um, hence, you will not, not see a massive effect of solvent polarity on the rate of such a reaction. Yeah? We have two ways of drawing such a radical mechanism. Um, you can either indicate the movement of, these, uh, of electrons like so. Yeah? So one electron from the hydrogen R dash bond is coming over to react with the R radical and we're moving the other electron yeah, with a fish hook arrow to the R dash group. Yeah? Or you can simply uh, um, indicate the reaction mechanism via the movement of a radical yeah? So both of these representations are okay, yeah, but uh, um, the former, so the one at the top, is a more cl complete representation, yeah, indicating the, um, also where you are making a new RH si uh, sigma bond here. So now that we understand uh, what radicals are, and what their principal differences are to uh, ions, uh, we will look in the next lecture how radicals are formed in detail. See you next time.